welcome to another episode of Swine Trends, an APC discussion. My name is Sierra Jackson, Sales Manager for APC Ingredients. Joining me today is Dr. Trey Kellner. Trey received his MS and PhD from Iowa State University in 2017, following his bachelor's degree at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Trey currently oversees the AMVC Nutrition Program. This feeding program accounts for over 160,000 sows and roughly 1.2 million market pigs per year across 10 states, encompassing 32 feed mills. Trey sets the cost of production, space utilization, and market weight strategies for AMVC and AMVC managed clients. Our topic today is to discuss strategies for getting pigs started. Trey, why is it important to get pigs started on feed right away after weaning? Yeah, great question. First, thanks for having me on, Sierra. It's a, it's a joy to kind of share my experiences and, and maybe some failures and learnings uh, with starting pigs on feed uh, throughout my young career. So really, um, as, as you think about why it's important on starting pigs on feed, um, the, the great metaphor to use is it's like building the foundation of your home. If you don't have a great foundation to build on, the anything that's above that, you know, the upstairs, the family room, the kitchen, uh, all that is vulnerable. Well, well, same with starting pigs on feed, right? If we don't start pigs on feed correctly, it really doesn't matter what we have for a feed med strategy or a feed budget strategy or a late finishing strategy or, or what our energy to lysine ratio should be, right? If we're not starting pigs on feed correctly, right, we're going to have increased mortality, we're going to have decreased intake, and that imprinting from that time period from when they're weaned to when they first start on feed and do they start on feed correctly uh, can have repercussions all the way till they're marketed. Right. So it, it may be the most important period of time from when that pig is bred to when it's it's farrowed to when it's um, finished is, is that 24 hours of trying to start that pig on feed. For sure. And what would you say has changed today versus what it was in the past? Sure, sure. So I'm uh, not going to date myself on how young I am, but <laughs> I hear that from all my elder colleagues is that. You know, pigs today just don't start on feed like they used to. And if we think back, you know, to the late 90s um, when we were doing segregated early weaned, a lot of those, you know, weaned pigs were 14 days of age. Right. Um, so, you know, that to hear that, you know, the pigs at that young of wean age um, potentially started better than the pigs that we're placing today in, in 2022 is 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 eye opening. Right. And you, and you want to listen to those those stories and those observations to see to see what has occurred and what you can learn from that. So a couple of things have happened with quote unquote today's modern pig, right? So um, rightfully so, we've selected the pig to try to be the most feed efficient and to use feed as, as efficiently as possible to put on lean accretion, to put on lean gain. One of the indirect consequences of that is we've lowered our feed intake, right? From wean to market, including the wean period. Right. So if we're selecting pigs for 163 days to maximize feed efficiency, well, we're going to have a lower feed intake pig on day one. Right. That's just a, a, an indirect consequence of, of that selection criteria. Right. So that's the first thing. Right. The second thing is um, what we've changed in terms of our vaccination strategy. Right. So if, if you talk to my my elder counterparts, you know, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, there wasn't a lot of vaccination before weaning, during weaning and after weaning like we have today. So we know when we vaccinate, we have an immune response. Right. When when we get our COVID shot, when we get our, our flu shot, um, we have an immune response. Well, the pig does the exact same thing. Right. So if we're doing that before weaning or, or during the weaning process, Right. That pig is without feed, so it doesn't, you know, have the 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 nutrient capability, um, you know, so it doesn't have a lot of glycogen stores, uh, therefore doesn't have a lot of available glucose. Right. And then we're having an immune response on top of that, um, you know, so so that pig can can go into a, a negative energy balance or a negative nutrient balance, um, uh, you know, way more than what it was in the the late late nineties or the mid nineties, and then the early two thousands, right? So that's something that's changed as well. Um, you know, one thing that we got to think about too that's changed is disease pressure as well, 
right? So once again, don't have the firsthand experience, but as I talked to my elder colleagues, you know, we didn't have PERS, we didn't have PD, we didn't have Delta Corona. Right. Um, you know, that disease pressure um, that we have today um, is, is significantly greater than what it was in the mid 90s. Right. So once again, we are, we are stimulating an immune response via vaccination. Uh, the pigs that were suckling were supported immune wise uh, by that nutrition from from the sow have now been removed from that and now have an immune response to that stress. Uh, they they may still be, um, you know, shedding active virus, whatever that may be. And then, by the way, we, we've taken them a 24 to 48 hour period without feed and the available the availability to have nutrients to to overcome that immune response and fight it appropriately. Right. So I think that's why we can have um, this this phenomenon that's multifactorial of why pigs are harder to start on feed today than what than what people have experienced maybe 20 years ago. Yeah, very good. So while you're talking about kind of vaccination timing in regards to weaning age and et cetera, what else um, can you say on weaning age and what are your recommendations on weaning day strategies? Sure. So every system in every South farm is going to be a bit different on what works best for them. So I would say first, the most important thing is to characterize the pig that you're weaning, right? Are you weaning a high health, high intake pig, or are you weaning a poor health, poor intake pig? And then the next thing to do is then characterize what does your flow look like? What does your flow look like on your sow farm? You know, how many farrowing crates do you have? What's your breeding target? What's your uh, expected farrowing rate? How many pigs do you expect to wean? Um, from those parameters. And then once you have that wean number, then what does your flow look like on your nursery side, on a three site site production, or what does it look like on a wean to finish site, right? So um, it's we found that it's it's very important to have single fills, meaning we have a wean number that's identical to the pig spaces that we have available in the facilities that we have once they're weaned, right? Um, the reason for that is we unfortunately will start some poor health pigs, especially this time of year, right? This is the PERS flu PD season, unfortunately, right? So every time we, we open that door and bring a new introduction of pigs in, um, we could be once again just stirring the pot, right? We could have pigs that are actively shedding um, that just cause pigs that, pigs that we might have successfully started on feed um, a week ago to fall back. So we had a lot of smaller sow farms that had some weird uh, placement numbers. So they would wean like 1,600 or 1,900, and we were trying to fit that into a 2,400 wean to finish barn flow. So we were having multiple wean events uh, within all of our facilities. And what we, what we found is um, pigs that we might have successfully started on feed, and then we brought a splash of pigs in, you know, 600 or 700 head. Um, those pigs that we then started on feed successfully then fall back. Why? Because they were re-exposed um, to the group that just came in, right? Those splash of pigs. Um, so we found that it's been more um, advantageous um, to go to a batch farrow system where we can have a, a wean number of pigs um, or a group of pigs that matches what we're weaning, right? So 2,400 pigs going into a 2,400 head barn that we wean on one day. So therefore, um, not only do those pigs have that, don't have that secondary shedding um, incident that we talked about, but then it also allows our grower to better set up the barn, right? So um, it's very important to have that barn heated and set up. Right. So think about yourself. Right. So if you took a nine hour trip to go see your grandparents, you know, for Christmas, like we just did. Right. right. And if you showed up and if the house was, let's just say, 48 degrees, uh, the floors were damp, there was no food, um, it, you would you would not do well. Right. We we all pass around uh, sickness um, during the holiday season. 
uh, I guarantee you we'd pass around more if that was the environment that we were we were going to, right? Instead, you go to grandma's and it's 72 degrees. There's cookies available. Um, food's already done, right? It's an outstanding environment. We need to have that same environment for those weaned pigs, right? So we need to have the heat slatted and dry. Um, we need to make sure that the room temp is acceptable. We need to make sure that um, feed's presented, right? So feed's delivered. It's there. It's in the feeder. It's on the mats. It's in the grill pans. It's ready to go. So if we just do that once per site, instead of having that grower try to do that twice or three times per site or once per room, especially in a nursery fashion where we have six rooms, okay, set up two rooms, and then the next week set up three rooms, and then next week set up one room, I'm going to guess that, that that last room or those last set of pins probably aren't set up to detail as maybe those those first two wean events were. All right, so let's just do it once. Um, so let's have the pigs be the same age, same health status, good or bad, have the environment ready to go once. And then also then that allows the grower to then mat feed and gruel feed um, for maybe a two-week period instead of maybe a five-week period um, if those pigs were, were done. It also allows our feed budgets to be correct, right? So we're going to deliver you know, starter feed and, and bag feed um, to set up that, those pigs correctly um, on feed. And we can talk about you know, those differences um, a bit later. Um, but once again, if we're feeding that over a five-week period, those bags that we may have, you know, designed for the first two days on feed may have already been used up accidentally, or maybe they sit there and weren't used at all. And then we have to feed it to an older pig. Um, or maybe we're delivering a, a starter budget through all our feeders and we don't get that assigned appropriately. So by the time that that last weaning gets there, guess what? We're on the second nursery stage instead of the first nursery stage. So all that work that we did fine tuning that ration, uh, we didn't get it executed. So whether it's a to, so to answer your question after this rambling, right, whether it's a 21 day old wean or a 24 day old wean or a 26 day wean, why that's important, right? The older you get, the, the more likely that pig is to be successful in starting on feed. We found that it's more important to have a single fill and, and wean age is kind of an outcome of that. So we do have some flows um, where, where we are a bit older and some flows where we're a bit younger, but we're trying to match up our wean size with what we're placing uh, with what we have on our wean to finish or our nursery flows. Yeah, that makes good sense. Um, and then what are your thoughts about water management and appropriate water consumption needed for each of those pigs? Sure. So that that's a really great point, Sierra. So not all pigs will eat within the first 24 hours, but most pigs will at least drink. Right. right. So it's a, it's important to, first of all, have water access and make sure that that water access is as quality as possible, meaning, um, you know, in between turns where those water lines flushed. Right. Or do we have we have a bunch of biofilm that's right there at that nipple. So so that first drink out of that cup water or that nipple um, is, is full of bacteria and once again is going to cascade that immune response even further. Right. Um, do do we have things that will then um, allow that pig to then start on feed or become better hydrated? Right. So are we using some type of electrolyte or or plasma based um, you know, uh, solution. There are, there are a multitude of, of water additives and, and water supplements that are available for pork producers. Find what works best for you, for your pig and the, the characterization of your pig is, as I mentioned before, and use those strategies, right? So make sure once again, that if you use those strategies, you have it on site when those pigs arrive, don't deliver it two days past, right? You've, you've already missed the window, right? Uh, we have a saying within our system that if you get the first two days right on feed, it'll save you two weeks of labor from there to market, right? So if we get the first 48 hours right, and if we have our growers and our employees get those first 48 hours right, they will save themselves almost two weeks of labor, meaning treatments, pulls, um, et cetera. Um, you know, from there to market. So it's really crucial. So if we're going to deliver, um, you know, bag feed um, or, or water additives or whatever it may be, uh, we need to make sure that it's ready before the pigs get there, not, not a couple days after. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, Sierra, on, on the wean age is making sure that we characterize that correctly and we feed to that as appropriately as we can. 
So a great success story that we found is, is trying to identify pigs that are weaned under the age of 18 and then feeding those a different budget. So the AMVC system is, is a majorly a batch farrow system. So we have five groups that uh, farrow and then wean every four weeks. Um, so uh, due to that strategy, uh, and it's kind of all in and all out in the farrowing house, um, if a sour gilt happens to be bred late and farrow late, uh, she's going to wean a younger litter, right? Sometimes 16, 17 days of age. Right. So what we do is uh, day before weaning is we mark those pigs in blue and that's a system wide approach. So every pig that's below 18 days of age gets marked in blue. And then we actually wean those into a separate compartment. That way, when they're placed, we can put them in a separate pen. So the only sort that we do um, upon placement is age. And then we'll kind of take the small five to 10 percent of pigs that are um, over 18 days of age. Right. So pigs are of age and place them in two different pens and that's it. So with those young pigs, we actually feed them a specialized diet that we bring out in bags and we will feed that till they're 21 days of age. The reason for that is they've simply just not developed the enzyme machinery that a 21 or 24 day old pig would have, right? right. So so we, we deliver that specialized feed, um, we feed that appropriately and then we start them on the regular budget from there. Right. So basically we're extending their budget. We're not saying, hey, we're going to we're going to feed them a different diet. No, we're going to add to that. So that way, when they're 21 days of age, like their counterparts, they're starting from the same starting point. Right. Um, and then that the, that small pen that I alluded to that is of age, um, we will feed them a more nutrient dense diet because we found out that they will simply eat less. Right. So the requirements of a pig whether it's a sow, a gill, a wean pig, or a market pig, those requirements are on a grams per day basis or a nutrient value per day basis, right? So if they're going to eat 20% less, rule of thumb is we need to make that diet 20% more nutrient dense, right? right? So, so we deliver a different diet for those two subset of pigs. Now, not every system can pull that off, right? I'm not saying, hey, here's, here's the strategy to implement. Um, run with it, right? You have to find out what you're able to execute and execute 100% of the time, right? Back to the story with the multiple fills, right? You can deliver the best diet in the world, but if you're using it and then when you're placing a, a you know, set of pigs and it's not available, what was the point, right? So, so that's why I was saying it's very important to characterize your pig and characterize your flow and understand what you're able to execute and then execute that as, as best as you can and as right as you can every time. Yes, exactly. Another essential topic would be nutrition and what sure. type of nutrition strategies have worked best for you in the past? Sure. Well, we talked a little bit about, you know, trying to feed the individual pig as best as you can, right? So for us, as, as close as we can get is within pen. Right. So subsetting those those young pigs aside, feeding them, subsetting our small pigs aside and feeding them. One thing that I haven't talked about is then feeding the difference between a poor intake, poor health pig and a high intake, high health pig. So we actually have two sets of, of starter feeding programs for those individual health statuses. And we keep it as simple as that. Are you high health, high intake or are you poor health, poor intake? And, and based off of that characterization of that sow farm and of that flow, we will then deliver uh, those two different feeding programs uh, to those individual sites based off of that health status, right? So things that we've found that have been more advantageous over time is, is trying to have a, a highly digestible protein source. Plasma is a great source of that. And then also plasma has has additional characteristics that, that you know, um, uh, provide immune support and feed intake response, right? So if we're dealing with a poor intake, poor health pig, well, poor intake was the first part of that equation. How do we help increase the intake of that pig, right? So how do we help increase the size of the first meal? And then as you'll see in poor health pigs, often pigs will take a first meal and then they'll have a big gap of period of time, sometimes a, a day or two before they have the second meal. Why? Because because they they ate that first meal, they digested it, they had a, a heat response to it, they had an immune response to it. Uh, the fever that they did had only increased, right? So it's kind of like when, when you have a bad flu or a, a bad food poisoning incident and you're like, I think I can do some chicken and noodle. 
and you kind of smell it and you're like, uh, I don't know. And you go ahead and eat it and you're just like, oh, that was the worst idea I've ever had. That wean pig's the same way, right? Goes to the feeder, eats a bit, and it's like, oh, man, I feel horrible. Well, the last thing that pig's one is going to do is then go back to that feeder and have that exact same reaction, right? Pigs are extremely intelligent, right? They, they, will, they will avoid things that they've had a negative response to in the past. So if they've had a negative response to that first meal, guess what? They're not going to have a second meal uh, very soon, right? So what do we have in that diet – um, that that the you know that promotes uh, a, a good response, right? So you know highly digestible uh, protein. So we don't have protein that's being fermented, um, you know, in the hind gut that's going to cause a, a bad immune response. Do we have nutrients that are highly digestible and easy to absorb and easy to utilize? Do we have nutrients that provide a, a quick energy value? Um, you know, a quick energy response post absorption, right? Do do we have ingredients? Um, that, you know, have, have some structure and some fiber to them, right? So we talk about, you know, st stool scores and, and um, you know, uh, uh, diarrhea incidences, right? So w what are our structural carbohydrates? What, what does our insoluble and soluble fractions uh, for fiber look like, right? So those are all things that we can tweak uh, based off of health status and intake to try to set that pig up. Up, up as well as we can, right? So th there are no silver bullets. You're not going to ever hear me say that, hey, you know, 20 pounds of plasma or this this percentage of, you know, fiber or, you know, hey, this additive or this medium chain fatty acid source or super dosing phytase or, you know, whatever it may be with on our list of tools is the silver bullet. But if you find that combination of what's able to increase feed intake as best as possible, and then shortens that time between that first meal and that second meal, you're more likely to be successful. And then right. the second thing on that is, so that's from the formulation perspective. I think it's extremely important for a nutritionist and a production system um, and anyone that's helping coach, um, you know, growers or employees is the execution piece of it. Right. So as I said, it's really easy to put something on paper and say, this is this is awesome. This is going to solve all our problems. No, you have to get it correct in barn and at the slat level every time for for it to be successful. Right. So it's extremely important to coach your growers and your employees on on how you want the feed to be presented. And what I mean by that is 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 do you want the feeder open right when they arrive or do you just want it on the mats do you want them to gruel feed if so what feed do you want them to gruel um what proportion of water and feed do you want that to be grueled uh, how often do you want them to mat and gruel feed right so the key to to what i found regardless of the nutrition solution um or or the plan is is getting that pig up as many times as possible during the first 48 hours post weaning right so when you stir that pig up when you walk through the pen um, that pig's going to get up, it's going to defecate, it's going to urinate, it's going to drink, and chances are it's going to eat as well. So if we're able to get that pig up four, six, eight times a day versus then once a day, it, it's just more opportunities for them to have a higher intake. So one thing that I really coach and, and will say to anyone, regardless of your plan, is – is you know get those pigs up multiple times so what we do is the first thing that we walk through the barn is we will mat and gruel feed every pin and we will do that once so we'll go through every pin on site we'll mat and gruel feed and get all those pigs stirred up then we'll have that grower or that employee then go through and do treatments pulls check ventilation check heaters do maintenance whatever it may be right and then at the end of that troring session, we'll then have them go through and then mat and gruel feed again, right? So if that employer, that grower is only able to get through that barn first thing in the morning and then right after they get done with their, their other job, then at least we've mat and gruel fed and got all those pigs up within that barn four times at least, right? That's way better than just once. Yeah, so, that, that sounds like that could be a really good plan. Um, if you were having some type of a labor shortage or, you know, what would be your other thoughts on maximizing results with that minimal labor? 
Yeah. So as I said, you know, two great strategies are mat and gruel feeding, right? So if you're only able to get through that barn once, or let's say you have labor shortages, you know, post weaning, um, you want to try to make feed as available as possible, right? So um, within our wean to finish barns, we have large uh, wet dry feeders. They're great feeders for 200 pound pigs not very good feeders for uh, 13 pound pigs, let alone young pigs or seven pound pigs, right? So one thing that we do is not only do we mat and gruel feed every pen for at least the first week on feed, uh, but we will have small nursery feeders um, that we will take around from site to site or we'll have on site that we'll place in those, those small pens or those young pens um, to try to make feed as accessible as possible. Um, and, and yeah, you, you don't want to put any barriers between them and the feed source. So another thing to think about is with zone heating and wean to finish barns is what's actually the temperature around the feeder. So sometimes it's really nice. It's 80 degrees underneath, you know, the brooder and the mat, but then the feeder is so far away that by the time you temp it, it's like 65 degrees, right? So once again, um, think about yourself. Um, it is minus three right now in Audubon, Iowa. Am I going to go outside across the street, um, you know, to, to get a turkey sandwich? Well, maybe if I'm really hungry, I mean, really, really hungry, but chances are I'll be good. I'll, I'll just wait a bit. It's, it's really nice here in this office today, right? The pig's going to be the same way, right? So we have to think about what hurdles are present to our feed access. So once again, by mat feeding or gruel feeding or having a smaller feeder or presenting feed as best as we can, we're just trying to strip those hurdles down um, to try to start that pig on feed as quick as we can um, and then have them go from there. Perfect. And so talking about labor shortages and challenges, what can you as a nutritionist do to help out producers with these challenges? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is to keep it simple and make sure it's clear, concise, and can be executed, right? So, so don't have a whole bunch of feeder setting adjustments, um, you know, saying, hey, day one, it needs to be 80%. Day two, it needs to be 75%. Day, you know, day three, it needs to be 60% of a pain coverage. No, keep it really simple, right? Uh, same with mat and gruel feeding. You know, some people, and, and it may be right in terms of the preciseness and the, the accuracy of it, but some people say, you know, do, do you know, 20% feed, 80% water, and then do 30% feed, 70% water. Well, what happens is that telephone game gets played or you've made it so hard that growers just go, what, what do you want me to do? Well, I just won't do it at all, right? Mm -hmm. So keep it really simple, right? So we just say mat and gruel feed. By mat, we mean a scoop of feed, and we give the same scoop out for everyone, right? We, we make it a, an annual Christmas present, right? So everyone gets the same scoop, so everyone's dealing with the same amount, right? So really simple. So that way you don't have anyone underfeeding or overfeeding, right? Same with gruel feeding. We just say 40-60 right? Now, I'm not saying that that might not be ideal for day one and that that may be too much water, um, you know, by the time you get to the end of the gruel period, but it's consistent. You can walk through any of our sites at any point in time and say that, hey, there's 40% feed in there and 60% water. Same with our feed presentation, right? We say that, hey, the pan should be 50 to 70% covered when our nursery diets are in there and 40 to 20% covered when our finishing diets are in there. That's it right? We keep it really simple, right? And executable. That way, if you're walking through any of our sites, or if you have a new grower or a new employee or a new production manager, whatever it may be, or if they're, it's the hundredth time that they've had pigs in their barn, right? Simple, it's easy, it's consistent, right? So, so that's the best thing that I can say when you're dealing with, with labor shortages or, or as we deal with labor that doesn't have the stockmanship qualities that we may have had 20 years ago, you have to keep things simple, repeatable, concise, and then once again, easy to validate, right? So any of our veterinarians, any of our production managers, any of our growers, um, frankly, any of our feed desk or our office staff, right, can walk through a barn and say, yes, that's correct, or no, it isn't. And then you have quick, easy, coachable actions um, in terms of correcting that, right? So um, sometimes we try to make it too hard and too complex and don't think about 
can we do this every single day? Can we block and tackle, right? Can we execute it? Not not saying that we shouldn't limit ourselves by any mean. Um, as I say, you know, we we have different rations for high health, poor health pigs. We we set up feed budgets different for small pigs and young pigs. But the reason we can do that is because we can execute that and we keep things around that simple, easy, easy to repeat um, and coachable and easy, easy to scoreboard as well. So so whether whether you have one site or whether you have 100 sites or, or whether you're working for a system, that, that would be my suggestion. I, I don't have the silver bullet or say, hey, here's the playbook. Go run with it. Right. The only suggestion that I would have is think about what you're able to execute it and then execute it really, really well. Great. Yeah. Really good overview there with a lot of valuable information. Is there anything um, we've talked about a lot today, but is there anything in our discussion that you would like to um, expand upon or we forgot about? No, I think we got it, Sierra. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you again for so much. Uh, great discussion here. I really appreciate your expertise and insight on getting pigs off to a good start. And also thank you to our viewers today for listening. If you would like to get more information on the topics covered or about the use of plasma proteins, please reach out to us at the contact page on our website at apcproteins.com. Thanks again.